So thank you. It's my privilege to be here today. Although I've been the uh, um, director of the Becker Friedman Institute for almost six years now, this is the first time I was invited to give a Becker Brown Bag. So I'm truly <laughs> honored to have this opportunity today. <laughs> There's high standards for this, uh, this event, as I, have under as I now understand. Um, so I, I want to talk about uncertainty in somewhat broader terms. And I want to talk about it in terms that are broader than we typically see them in, in, in economics and finance classes. I want to kind of push beyond this notion of risk, which is uh, the common paradigm in, in, in uh, economic model building. Push beyond that, I want to motivate why, and I want to indicate the, um, some potential value to doing so. Uh, today's talk is going to focus mainly on, I, I'm going to kind of show you some illustrative somewhat stylized models of financial markets. Um, but I, these same issues are really, I think, are central to thinking about economic policy and how to construct, po and, and how to construct meaningful policy. And I'll, I'll, I might talk a little bit about that at the end of, end of today's talk. So um, my research uh, likes to bring together insights from three different disciplines and kind of put them together, stir them up, mix them together, and see what happens. <coughs> uh, Macroeconomics. So what does macroeconomics do? Applied macroeconomics studies the, the, the sources of, of aggregate fluctuations and the consequences that they play out over time. And the way we capture this is we typically, uh, in models, we kind of build models in which there's these impulses or random shocks that hit things. Uh, we, we, we figure out cle cle clever labels for those shocks, monetary policy shocks, technology shocks, uh, uh, and the like. And then we trace through their consequences. Uh, and this is a longstanding tradition in, in, in macroeconomics going back to Ragnar Frisch. Um, asset prices. What does asset pricing do? Well, you know, as you know from your various classes, asset prices, pricing focuses on market compensations for exposure to, among other things, macroeconomic shocks. So what's special about macroeconomic shocks? Well, think about, um, first of all, an auto, someone uh, running and insuring automobiles, or some company. They have at their ability to, to look across a whole bunch of different people to randomly get into accidents and average across the population. So they're, they're facing a, what, what economists often call idiosyncratic uncertainties. But these are types of uncertainties which you can so-called diversify away. Macro shocks hit the whole economy. As a consequence, they can't be diversified away. So as you kind of know from basic asset pricing uh, you know, reasoning, it's the macroeconomic shocks that require compensation, whatever cash flows are exposed to them. I also like to bring in statistics involved in this. So what is, as you know from statistics, statistics provides methods for assessing the extent of our knowledge based on existing evidence. For me, it also supports a decision theory that allows us to account for uncertainty. And what I hope to convince you of is, is there's a fascinating interplay between these three areas of research. Well before my time was an economist called Frank Knight. He was in the committee for, uh, he was in the economics department here at the, at, the, at the University of Chicago. He's often viewed as one of the founders of the so-called Chicago School of Economics. I've been here since the early 80s. I'm still not sure what the Chicago School of Economics is, but he was a founder of it, so whatever it might be. Uh, but, but, but anyway, Frank Knight uh, wrote this book. The book was Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit. And he was really probing going beyond these so-called risk notions to broader notions of uncertainty. And um, this is a book where lots of people cite it. It's a really heavily cited book. I'm quite convinced that very few people have actually read it because it's actually incoherent on a lot, on a lot of these topics. But it's, a, but it's really fashionable to cite. So it, it's, uh, 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 but, but here's one quote that I actually find to be uh, um, quite interesting as kind of characterizing the challenges we face in, in building economic models. We must infer, infer what the future situation would be without our interference and what changes will be wrought by our actions. Fortunately or unfortunately, none of these processes is infallible or indeed ever accurate and complete. So how do we confront that type of phenomenon, that type of situation? So here's put together a couple things here. Um, probability theory prior to Jacob Bernoulli, this is a Jacob, picture of Jacob Bernoulli on your left, was all about games of chance. So what games of chance? The so games of chance are like flipping coins, rolling dice. These are situations where you know probabilities, but you don't know outcomes. Right? Jacob Bernoulli, uh, according to my um, 
the expert of, of, of uh, the history of statistics that I draw on, Steven Stigler, gives him credit for the first person to actually think about using probabilities to confront social scientific data. These, th these are data in which we don't know probabilities, and we have to learn to use evidence to figure them out. He came up with something that's you know, still referred to as a law of large numbers. His work actually did more than that, but it was kind of a, it's, it kind of pushed probability theory beyond the situation where we know probabilities to we have to figure stuff out using data. On the right-hand side is Pizarro. It's a painting by Pizarro, uh, and, and it's a painting of a marketplace. And what goes on in this marketplace? People come to a market. They don't know what the price is, what price is going to go for their goods. They don't know how much demand there's going to be. Uh, they don't know how expensive things are going to be. They also face uncertainty. So, so not only is there uncertainty from, that, from this Bernoulli perspective, looking at data, the people inside our models also face uncertainty. And the interplay between the, uh, the two of these are fascinating. So I like to think about two roles for statistics. One is the usual role you get in, in, in your statistics classes. You're outside a model. You, um, uh, the model is, say, given to you. You've got data. You do things like estimate unknown parameters. You assess model implications. You test models. You, uh, and, um, and, 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 and kind of see how reliable they are. That's kind of standard statistics. Now, we also have people inside our models, and we, get, and we have to model them. So, so when constructing a dynamic model, a researcher has to depict the economic actors, the, so the consumers, enterprises, as they cope with uncertainty. And, and we have to do, deduce the consequences for market outcomes, the consequences for resource allocation, and the like. So what I want to be doing is I want to take in these statistical insights and try to see what happens when, when, when we pass them all the way inside our model and, see, and kind of see what we can get out of this and, and uh, go forward. So let me draw, I'm going to draw distinctions between different types of uncertainty. The first one is the one I've been talking about called risk. We know probabilities, we don't know outcomes. So here's an urn, it's got you know, a fraction, half the balls are red, half the balls are blue, we draw it randomly. The probabilities are 50-50. It could be 40-60, but that's a situation where we know, we know probabilities, but we don't know outcomes. And that is risk. So we talk about risk aversion when we, when we build economic models. We typically presume people, uh, the people are modeling no probabilities. They, they just don't know outcomes. So I want to also introduce this other construct called ambiguity. This is a situation kind of like Bernoulli faced. You've got an unknown number of red balls, an unknown number of blue balls inside this urn. And you've got to figure it out. So you can draw one out, put it back in, draw another one out, put it back in, tabulate what happens. As you get more and more evidence, you get a better, better and better idea of what fraction of the balls are red and what fractions are blue. So we're learning through data. But, but there's this type of uncertainty that we, there's this basic uncertainty, red versus blue balls. Okay? Um, some of you have seen the so-called Bayesian paradigm uh, in, uh, um, in statistics. It was kind of an elegant way to confront this, stuff, this through so-called so subjective probabilities, kind of uh, filling, out probability, you know, filling out the probabilities that, that we don't know through, through, through subjective thinking. But even the pioneers of Bayesian methods, DeFinetti and Savage, really, uh, really said, well, these subjective inputs we really only know very crudely. Now, I do time series and interested in dynamic models. In some sense, we're one step more complicated than the one I just gave you. Um, imagine we've got a whole bunch of urns, and the urns change a little bit over time, maybe in somewhat arbitrary ways. The urn tomorrow may not be identical to the urn today, and, and we're drawing out of the urns and trying to figure stuff out. So now we're kind of chasing this moving target, because whenever we get more evidence, things change on us. And, and, and that's really the type of uh, um, <clears throat> more broader notion of uncertainty, which I want to be uh, discussing today. So, 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 so we, don't have this, we don't have this ability to just figure things out exactly, uh, arbitrarily well because, because things are changing on us. So one possibility is we give up. I'm going to try to argue maybe we should do, do something else. Okay? So let me just summarize. Risk. What probabilities is a model assigned to events in the future? Okay? Uh, so, 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 so when we face risk, we know probabilities, we don't know outcomes. Model ambiguity, we have multiple views of the world, multiple models in our head. How much confidence do we, do, do we place in each of these? And the third one is perhaps the most challenging one. I've, uh, I've spent a career kind of trying to build economic models. The, the models that economists have are wrong, they're false. 
Um, uh, uh, this is actually true in all disciplines, but it's particularly, but, but certainly true in economics. We're, our models are highly stylized, they're simplified, they're, they're there to make insights, but strictly speaking, they're, you know, they're, they're not going to explain you know, all the complexities of the world or, or, or even of the economy itself. So how do we use these models that are not perfect, we know they're not perfect, uh, in smart and intelligent ways? So this is a third type, and this is, this is in some sense the most challenging one for a model builder to confront, but may, maybe in many respects the most important one to confront. So I, I like to contrast these three different types of uncertainty. So now I'm going to take a commercial break. A while ago, I, I, I wrote this book with, this, uh, with a co-author named Tom Sargent, who's at NYU. Um, the book's called Robustness, and what's here is essentially what was on the cover of this book. Now, it turns out that, um, as I mentioned before, there was a, I have a colleague, Stephen Stigler. He's a, a, his father was a very distinguished economist here. Uh, Stephen's a very distinguished statistician. He's an expert in the history of statistics. And, and then a couple of years ago, he, um, he wrote this review article. So being at the University of Chicago just is, can be very, very challenging. We, we, we tend not to give people lots of pats on the back. So Stephen writes this book, this, uh, this review article. He lifts out... Um, the book cover that, uh, that I had with Sargent, and he points out that something's missing in their book cover. And he said, and, 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 he, and he points out, uh, so he's about writing this review article on robustness in statistics, and he kind of notes the pitfalls of kind of ignoring too much data when you uh, uh, con uh, confront robustness, and he trusts our book out as an example of people who are ignoring, uh, ignoring a key part of the data. So I'm going to show you in just a minute what's missing here. But anyway, I... Before I show that to you, I call up Stephen and said, you know, this isn't the most friendly review I, as I mentioned of our work that we've, that we've ever had. And he um, said to me very, very bluntly, well, I've just given your book a ton of publicity in the statistics community. Um, I, I, I expect I've helped your book sales, and please send me some of the royalties. So anyway, <laughs> so Stephen Stegler was exactly right. There's something missing in our book cover. Uh, our publisher made us omit it, and here's the real painting by Latour. And this is the one I want to talk about. Uh, this painting, there's a person, uh, this person on your right who's playing cards, perhaps somewhat naively. There's a dealer here with somewhat shifty eyes. There's someone pouring booze, seems to be in part of it. And then, of course, there's a person all the way on the left with something funny going on behind his back, these cards. Um, so, so, what's this painting, so, so, uh, so, so what's this painting doing here? Well. We can use our models and probabilities naively, like the person on the right, uh, thinking this is a fair card game and, and proceed. Or else we can also ask the question, maybe things, maybe there's a possibility things are wrong. Maybe, and, and, and start asking, well, things aren't quite right, uh, in what ways might they go wrong? And, and, and in using, in, you know, in using um, models in economics, I think that's a fruitful thing to be doing. Our, we've got these models out there. We know they're not perfect. We know they have flaws. What type of flaws would have the would would be most consequential to our analysis, and not behave naively like the person here on the right who says, "Well, you know, I've written down a mathematical model that tells me probabilities. I'm done." So, I like to think that, therefore about statistical complexity. So we've got these environments, and these are you know just like those urns that, where things changed arbitrarily over time. Um, it's hard to draw inferences in, in general. You know, we look out at financial markets. There's a lot going on in them. We can we can pretend we can write down simple models of them, but you know, there's there's at the end of the day, there's simplifications. Where does statistics come into play? It helps us think about when is it challenging to learn and draw inferences. Now, there's lots of discussion these days in behavioral finance, behavioral economics, and the like. Um, to me, too little of that discussion uh, uh, looks at the interplay between that and statistical and complexity. If we're in environments where it's very, very hard to figure things out, there's much more scope for behavioral distortions. There's much more scope for, for heterogeneity and beliefs uh, and, and, uh, and the like. So I, so I think the interplay between kind of how we cope with uncertainty and, and, the, and kind of how complex the environment is is absolutely crucial. So, so when does statistical uncertainty induce fluctuations in market prices and, and impact resource allocation? So, so what I want to head towards is taking a broader perspective on certainty than is typical in economic analyses. I had a choice to give you a bunch of mathematical equations or paintings. Hopefully you like the, the, the outcome of this choice. This is a painting by Velasquez, uh, uh, and, and it's, uh, I think it's in the Prada. And the person, 
the little girl is, is a princess. In the background is either a mirror or a picture of her parents, uh, the king and queen. She has several maids in waiting here. Interesting enough, the painter decided to put himself in the to put himself in his own painting. The person all the way on the left is apparently the painter uh, doing the painting. And then there's this mysterious person out, you know, it's walking out the back end, back way, and trying to speculate who that might be as well. This is an incredibly complex painting. You could stare at this for a long time and, and kind of speculate what's going on inside of it. And I, and, and in many respects, I think the uncertainty that we would have to cope in our own decision making and thinking about the economy and the like has has has, uh, has similar type of complexities to it. You know, we can stare at it a long time and kind of maybe never figure things out exactly, but uh, uh, and proceed. As, as I indicated, I want to be placing uncertain investors inside economic models. And then I want to kind of depict how they cope with the future, and, and I want to try to think about these in somewhat general terms. And, and deduce market responses, prices, resource allocations, and the like. So the, mo the, the, the approach that's been um, really prevalent in the economics literature since the mid-70s um, mid is the so-called rational expectations approach. Now, how does it, now, as I said, all models are simplifications, as is rational expectations. It's, it's not meant to capture exactly how people behave. It's not to meant, be meant to be an interesting model of individual behavior, uh, but, but more of market economies. And how does this work? The, the, so um, my, my colleague, Bob Lucas, was, was, was a really um, made, made just fundamental contributions to this area and, and, and its applications. So we've got economic actors. Think of them as investors. The idea is that they use long histories of data. So uh, just like uh, Bernoulli had this law of large numbers where you eventually figure stuff out, well, well, as an approximation, we'll presume that people have figured stuff out. They figured out you know, which, uh, which is the correct model, parameters, uh, and the like. And, and so what this di did is it yielded a very nice and elegant stochastic notion of an equilibrium in which expectations were determined inside the model. Um, so prior to this, people were just kind of making up expectations from the outside. This is saying, well, let's look at the model itself. The model itself, as I piece that together, is that part of figuring out the model is figuring out people's expectations because I'm going to have the model tell me what their expectation should be. And that was the, 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 and that, and that's the rational expectations approach to things. And what it did very, very nicely is the following. It gave us a very nice, coherent approach to public po to policy analysis. The reason we build models is to among other things, make guesses as to what, how the, what happens if we change the economic environment, what happens to outcomes, what happens if we change tax policies, monetary policies, or the like. Okay? And um, so this gives concrete predictions about how people's beliefs will at least eventually behave when we change policies. And it deliberately pushes, puts off the table this notion of systematically fooling people. Uh, you know, yeah, perhaps policymakers can can can, uh, can fool people temporarily, but the notion here is you really can't fool them permanently. And this gives a very coherent way of to, just pulling that lever off the table, which I, which I think is very very productive. But as applied modeling, it also neglects some components of uncertainty by featuring only risk. So so its rational expectations approach really loaded up on risk. There, there, uh, there were some extensions to rational learning that, that, uh, um, uh, that pushed it a little bit further, but, but it left some important statistical challenges off the table, including how do we use models that are incorrect. So I want to go beyond it. So let me motivate things a little bit. By uh, There's been a recent debate about long-term macroeconomic uncertainty, and, and it comes in different guises. Um, uh, <coughs> Uh, people debate secular stagnation. There was like you know, previously arguments between Bernanke and, and, uh, and, and Summers about secular stagnation. Um, I'm going to talk about ones from some very eminent uh, economic historians. Um, and, and they've been debating about, well, maybe all the technological greatness is a thing of the past and it's not going to happen in the future, or, or, or should we be optimistic going forward? And so Joel Mulcair would argue well, there's a myriad of reasons why the future should bring more technological progress than ever before. Perhaps the most important being technological innovation itself creates questions and problems that need to be fixed through further, further technological progress. Bob Gordon wrote this incredible book on the, recently published on the history of, uh, of, uh, of technology in the US. And he has this very last chapter that's very, very speculative, under which he says, uh, the rise and fall of growth are inevitable when we recognize progress occurs more rapidly in some periods than others. 
then it picks a century out between 1870 and 1970 as being unique. And many of these inventions can only happen once and others reach natural limits. So he, so he takes a much more pessimistic view of technological progress going forward. Rather than, than having to embrace one or the other of these, uh, uh, perhaps, the, perhaps the correct view is that we are not quite sure which is the correct one and how do we kind of cope with this type of uncertainty. And this is kind of pretty fundamental uncertainty we're talking about here. How do we confront this? So now let me turn to asset pricing. Um, I'm going to pose it a little bit differently than what you see in your investments classes, but it's connected. So imagine that we're going to uh, think about this macro economy as these impulses or shocks. So think of WT plus 1 as a shock that happens tomorrow, and there may be a bunch of these. Okay? And, then, and then part of what economists do, this goes back to Ragnar Frisch, uh, when it, in the studies on impulse and propagation, is they study the impact on the macro time series or cash flow of the shock in future times. So, so the shock happens, happens tomorrow or the next quarter, what happens the following quarter, the quarter after that, and on out. Um, they look at this from the standpoint of evidence. They look at this from the standpoint of what models tell them and, then, and often try to match the two together. So that's kind of applied or empirical macroeconomics. So for, for the asset pricing part of this, let's think about, about this shock as an exposure to, say, risk. Okay? And the shock, therefore, requires compensation, because this is one of these macro things, with shocks that can't be diversified away. And then the shock plays out over time. The magnitude of the compensation of the price is going to depend on the date of the cash flow. So I'm looking today. I'm going to be shifting prices. The shock's going to affect things in the future. At every future date, there's going to be a price effect. And then as I look across shocks, I can, I, I'm going to get different compensations as well. So there's two different dimensions of this. I go across different shocks. Uh, there's different compensations, but also I go across horizons, the pricing impacts will be different. And so dynamic models of, uh, of asset prices imply these compensations. So, so the familiar CAPM that we've seen in various different classes is kind of a one-period or static version of this type of analysis, where we figure out compensations over the, uh, say, over one-period returns. Here I'm kind of playing this out over, uh, over, over multiple horizons and, and, and looking at pricing consequences. Right. So... Um, so here's a, a model in which there's, uh, um, this is going to be a risk-based model in which there's um, uncertainty, there's, uh, there's, un there's, there's going to be a growth process in the macroeconomy that's going to carry with it some uncertainty attached to it. There's going to be random shocks to, to, to the economy, but also random shocks to its growth rate. And so I'm going to just do a decomposition that time series people like to do in a permanent, to a permanent shock and a temporary shock. Uh, um, the idea is a permanent mm -hmm. shock when you hit the economy, it's going to have permanent consequences. So think of that from the standpoint of the picture on the right. Okay? A shock occurs at, 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 um, immediately at, say, date zero here. It plays out over time, and, and, it gets large, and, and its responses actually grow on you over time because it's a shock to a growth rate. In contrast, a temporary shock, like a monetary policy. So, you know, sometimes people think monetary policy shocks are temporary. Uh, um, monetary policy shock is, is, is something that you know, might start uh, at an even larger magnitude, but because of its transient nature, but its transient consequences, it plays, it, it eventually, it, 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 it kind of eventually gets arbitrarily close to zero. Now, now, now there's a band here. What's this band? So economists know that macroeconomies kind of fluctuate, um, that there's, uh, um, have more volatile periods than other periods. So what do we do as a macroeconomist? We invent shocks. We're, we're very good at this. We're not always so good at telling you what the shocks, you know, give you a deep explanation for them. So this so-called stochastic volatility is all about that. It's a, it's a random process for volatility. Uh, um, and, and, uh, and, and, and so what that band depicts is the fact that there's a stochastic volatility going on here. And, uh, and the consequences of the shock will, will depend on whichever, whether you're in a high volatility state or a low volatility state. And, and, uh, and then these are kind of the 0.1 to 0.9 deciles. So these aren't like standard errors. These are actually um, capturing the underlying riskiness in the, uh, uh, in the economy and the differential periods you know, and, the, and, the, and the differentiation between high and low volatility. So how about pricing? So this is all like so-called impulse responses. Okay? Now, 
the kind of original conventional macroeconomic model basically took, took these responses and, and, and just presumed that the compensations were proportional to, to, uh, to these so-called impulse response functions. It's a, it's, it's a so-called constant relative risk aversion model of preferences or, or, or a power utility model. And this is the one that macroeconomists were using, uh, was still used to this date quite, that, quite a bit. And this red dot dash lines are the ones that really are just re, you know, retracing the t t t proportional responses. However, the recursive utility was this, uh, uh, was this development of preferences that said the intertemporal composition of risk should matter. We should really care about the entire in intertemporal composition. And once you care about the intertemporal composition, forward-looking guesses become very, very important. So speculations about the future matter a lot, even in short-term pricing and short-term valuations. And that's what's showing up in the blue line here. The, the, these are the prices. These are the prices to, these, uh, um, to the permanent shock and, and the temporary shock. Because these recursive utility models have a lot of forward-looking behavior in them, what happens is the, permanent, uh, the, the price responses become big almost immediately or in the case of a temporary shock, become small almost immediately. Because, and this is all because of the forward-looking behavior uh, built into these preference specifications. And again, the, at least for the blue ones, the bands are determining these, uh, differential, uh, these, uh, these differential price responses between high and low volatility states of the macroeconomy. So, so one of the big victories of, uh, of, of asset pricing models, structural asset pricing models, is it took these compensations from the red line that started off really, really small, and made them big immediately, moved, moved from, from here to there, instead of eventually. The, uh, the previous models had them big eventually. Uh, these recursive utility models had those compensations big immediately. And so this uncertainty about long-term growth rates can have even short-term pricing consequences. And that's, uh, that, that's what was this, that was a big victory of these models, of these preference models. Now, these were all what I think of as risk inside a model. Every, the investors know probabilities here. And so they, and, 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 and really to make this lever work, we're endowing investors with, a, with, with some actually statistically subtle components of the macro time series. If I, if I were looking at this data externally, I would have trouble figuring out and measuring some of these key parameters in this model. But, but the way the calculations work is, is they give investors knowledge of those parameters. So, so it leads one to ask, where does this confidence come from? As I indicated before, we're imposing stochastic volatility exogenously. There's no doubt the financial markets are more volatile some, some, some time brands than others. But some, it's also nice to get endogenous explanations for that and not just impose it exogenously. And finally, to get any notable types of prices, we had to make impose risk aversion that to uh, most economists looks to be quite, uh, quite large risk aversion coefficients seem uh, potentially uh, very hard to defend their magnitudes. Okay. So this is this literature delivered some success, but success with a, with, with a bit of a question mark. Uh, it really played off the fact that this pushed this rational expectations paradigm, to my taste, a little bit too far because I, there, there's pieces of the uh, of these inputs that it's just hard to imagine investors had figured out. Um, I think of the about the first half of my career first, uh, was all about imposing rational expectations and figuring out how to do statistics with, under rational expectations. I kind of had, I kind of spent a lot of time tell, telling people what was wrong with their models and why they were flawed and everything, uh, instead of like you know, getting great resolutions. So instead of, I, instead of me pretending the, uh, uh, the investors are smart and I was dumb, I decided maybe, maybe we should put them on comparable footing. So I try to make, make the investors also have challenges. I, I, perhaps this was uh, uh, naive of me to think that, that the same, same concerns would be passed on to investors, but I actually believe it's not naive. I, I think we were being somewhat simplistic in the way we were capturing investor behavior. OK, so here I'm, here's, my only equa well, here's my only equation. And you don't have to think too hard about this. This y is just uh, some, some proxy for the overall macroeconomy. And the first equation shows, shows you that, 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 you know, think of the y as kind of some logarithm of consumption, say. Uh, the growth rate in the macroeconomy ha is hit by a random shocks, these w's. There's going uh, to uh, be two of them. And then there's going to be this z process. Think of the z process as this growth rate process. And then the second equation is going to give kind of a, what's, what's called a first order autoregressive process for the growth, growth itself. So, so the shock to growth rates 
play out over time. And, and, and that's consistent with those pat impulse response patterns, which I talked about before. So one way to go is just imagine that investors know those parameters. In this case, beta and kappa. Okay, and that's, and that's kind of consistent with the type of calculations I talked about, which, um, which I reported to previously. So that's just this point here. Okay, but, you know, we fit time series data, make our best guesses, and kind of you know, presume that that's what investors know. Um, so now what I want to do is I want to push away from that. I want to say, well, suppose that, first of all, they don't know beta and kappa. Second of all, beta and kappa might change over time. There might be a, kind of a bit of a moving target going on here. They, 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 and, and finally, the model might, be, you know, might itself be somewhat misspecified. This is a highly simple stylized model. So for starters, what I want to do is I don't want to take that point and replace it by a region. So suppose we replace that, that dot by a circle. And this is, you know, this looks a little bit like confidence, uh, confidence regions you might see in statistics class, but it's not really that, it's, although it's related. These, these are regions of ex ante similar, statistically similar models, uh, in this case, parameter values of beta and kappa. Moreover, I'm going to allow them, so, so suppose I move from that point to that region, and I, and I just take into account of it, that you know, somehow the kappas and betas are, are sitting inside that region. Moreover, I'm going to allow them to vary, but I'm going to always keep them inside that region somewhere. They can, they, can, they can vary over time. I don't want to pretend I know the process that governs the uh, time variation. Right. So here's a, so so at the point one has full confidence in, in some one model. The blue one has less confidence, and then we could go even further to, to this pink one with even for, yeah, less confidence. And I can imagine you know moving around that you know, that bigger regions of, and, and exploring the consequences of changing beta the parameters beta and kappa. And I can do other things as well. Okay. So. So um, the next thing I need is, is some type of decision theory. I need some, you know, how do we cope with this type of uncertainty, not knowing the parameters, uh, allowing the models to be misspecified. So uh, I'm going to appeal to some literature that comes out of both decision theory and economics and, and um, uh, also out of uh, engineering and control theory. I'm going to have these people be ambiguity averse or concerned about model misspecification. And they're going to make adjustments to this. I want them to be using models in sensible ways instead of discarding them. But I still am using statistics and probabilities to try to, try to construct those sets. Okay? And under ambiguity aversion, you're averse to uncertainty about probabilities over future events. But then what you do is you target the uncertainty that is most adverse, that has the most adverse consequences for the decision maker. So it, so I look across all these different parameter configurations, and I find which are the ones that the de a decision maker would be most concerned about that would cause the biggest problems. You know, just like the guy playing the card game, uh, uh, uncovering the, the, the possibility that someone might be cheating him. So what, what I want to get out of this is some battle going on between bears and bulls, I guess. Here's the bear bull rumble by DeRoy. Um, but how can I get this? How can I get something that looks like this? How can I get, have financial markets that have, you know, sometimes in the financial sector, people uh, from the financial sector, people talk about risk on and risk off. How can I get caution and boldness going, playing out over time? And, and kind of what's the mechanism for that to happen? So here's how things work. I'm going to spare you the actual calculations. And, 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 I've, and as you see, I'm, I'm doing this in a simple illustration. Suppose the private sector is uncertain about the future macroeconomic growth rates. For instance, they're uncertain about those parameters, beta and kappa, and they may even think the model might be wrong. Now, it, when you face that uncertainty, this is uncertainty about how you respond to changes in the growth rate. Imagine you're in good times. Suppose that Z, that Z, that I, uh, um, is, um, is some nice positive number, and so we're in good times. Okay? In good times, I love persistence. It says, let's let the good times roll. Great things are going to happen. What I fear is the lack of persistence. How about bad times? Bad times, persistence. Well, bad times, persistence is really bad because I'm going to be stuck in the rut and I'm not going to get out of them very quickly. So, uh, and, and good, and the lack of persistence is what you would really hope. Yeah, hope is happening. So, your perspective now on what is a, a good and a bad model, or, 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 these in, or, or these values of these parameters, changes depending on whether you're sitting in in uh, situations of uh, of um, hardy growth or, or, or say, more, more pessimistic or, or, or retarded growth. Okay. 
And so this gives this type of change in perspective, depending upon, upon where we sit in the business cycle, itself induces fluctuations in the market price of uncertainty. And this can be a source of it. And in, these, um, and in good times, uh, you might think that uh, um, even though you um, fear the lack of persistence, and uh, since you fear the lack of persistence, in good times, you exit the good times much more quickly as well. And so that's, you know, that plays out in very interesting behavior, the predictive behavior in terms of how financial markets work. Here's ha what happens if I compound this, the, uh, the, uh, these calculations over time. Th there's a black line there. That's my baseline model prediction. Uh, um, and then there's a cone-shaped gray region. And those are the like 0.1 to 0.9 deciles that the model tells me are there. And you know, this is a model where uncertainty compounds over time. So as, so as things play out over time, the cone, uh, 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 the amount of uncertainty is going to expand on us in a, in, in a straight cone-shaped region. Now, I'm going to make making cautious investments. I think that this model might be an interesting benchmark, but, but, I'm, uh, but then under caution, I'm, I'm going to want to make some adjustments. That model could be wrong, and I want to think about how it's going to be wrong. So think about taking that cone-shaped region, just twisting it somewhat downwards, okay? And that gives the red line. So even though the gray line captures your, your, your best guess ba your baseline to use the model cautiously, you do this cautious adjustment. And the cautious adjustment here has you look at uh, the macroeconomy as, as with, with somewhat more skepticism. OK, one could use a different behavioral model and, 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 and twist things upwards as well. But the thing, uh, uh, and saying that people are naive and excessively confident and the like, and, and, and opt or excessively optimistic, and, and, and say twist upwards. But the thing I, that I want to drive home here is we're going to be using statistical methods to figure out how much it makes sense to, to do this tilting towards this more conservative direction. So, so, so this gives me kind of a range of which, you know, more generally a range of uh, where behavioral anomalies might sit, you know, um, sit as well. So what, do we, what, what I claim we've achieved here. Um, so I built a, a tractable model approach for confronting uncertainty. It's a mechanism that induces fluctuations in asset values. It's not, we're not making it up by stochastic volatility. We're actually having this perspective on what is a good and bad model that this changes over time. And it comes from this fact that investors fear persistence in bad times, um, and they um, fear the lack of persistence in good times. So, so, so investors' perspectives on models is changing, depending on where we are in the business cycle. And that's the, that's the basic mechanism here. Um, so I'd love to talk about policy for another 45 minutes, but I'll get there in a minute. Um, it would be somewhat shorter. On a broader perspective, it's really difficult empirically to disentangle risk aversion from belief distortions. So one possibility is, 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 is we make risk aversion do all the work, and that's, what, and that's really where structural models and finance have you know, largely been. But here I'm kind of pushing this belief distortion channel. And for me, belief distortions are more compelling in environments where uncertainty is complex. Statistical tools provide valuable ways to assess this environmental complexity. And I see value to pushing beyond the risk model commonly embraced in economics and finance to, uh, to kind of incorporating statistical complexity. So my observation of uh, economists that want to in influence policymakers is roughly the following. Policymakers like um, confident economists. So the economists that go to talk to policymakers project an incredible degree of confidence, as if they kind of know exactly what we ought to be doing, because, because that's the way you influence policy. Well, the, well this is a non-trivial distortion in how we think about economic policy, because, that, because often that confidence is phony, arbitrary, and, and, and there's considerable uncertainty to our answers. Um, I, I have a a co-author named uh, Buzz Brock who told me the following story. Um, Lyndon Johnson, who was president in the 60s, uh, was confronted by people who said, well, the, well, well there's uncertainty in, uh, in our an answers, so we'll, uh, so we'll give you a range of numbers instead of one. And Lyndon Johnson said, ranges are for cows. I want a number. And, the, and there's a sense in which that's what policymakers demand, and, and economists are always going to be out there to provide that type of confidence. But it's kind of a phony confidence. It's not really there in the evidence. And so. Um, I think it's much more productive to acknowledge the nature of that uncertainty and, to, and, and then to confront it through sensible and, and, and uh, intelligent ways. So here I've got a quote from Hayek. So Hayek's, this is an interesting context of this quote. Hayek shared the Nobel Prize with Myrdal, and, and the two of them had very different perspectives on economics. Um, Hayek goes in, um, he gets a Nobel Prize in economic sciences and writes an essay challenging whether economics is really a science or not. It was kind of a rather remarkable essay given the context. Um, now, 
Hayek was deeply susceptible, uh, uh, suspicious of quantitative models. So, so I don't fully embrace all Hayek's uh, uh, claims. But I kind of like this quote in there. This is a quote from his Nobel address. Even if true scientists should recognize the limits of studying human behavior, as long as the public has expectations, there will be people who pretend or believe that they can do more to meet popular demand than is really what, than what is really in their power. So I think that's a, it's, it's a really perspe a perspective, a perceptive comment, and I think it uh, remains applicable today. Um, as I say, this is also something I'm fascinated with. If you're curious about discussions of stuff like this, I, I recently wrote an article that has one of my few papers that has absolutely no math in it. Uh, I wrote it for, somewhat ironically, for a journal called No, K-N-O-W, about uncertainty and uncertainty in our analysis and answers. But anyway, it's, it's, it's posted on my webpage. Um, so let me close by going, there's, um, uh, by kind of quoting one of my favorite uh, philosophers in the, uh, in the past history of the United States. Ignorance is the path from cocky ignorance to miserable uncertainty. And with that, I'll uh, turn it open to questions. Regarding the equation in your model, yeah. we can see that the shock, the W, has a T plus 1 yeah. for, a, for a period T at the current, let's call it GDP growth. Why is, a, why is, a, why is the shock in the future and not in the present? Uh, the left-hand variable was also the future. So it's, it, was, uh, it was trying to explain the growth rate between T and T plus 1, the actual realized growth rate, not the predicted growth rate. And so the realized growth rate is so the realized growth rate itself is going to respond to a shock. Plus, there'll be a shock to the uh, future value of the uh, of the growth rate itself. But it's because the left-hand side variable had a t plus one date on it that, that 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 the shock had a t plus one date on it. Maybe you could give some more of your thoughts on um, just so so what I gathered from your speech was that this this idea of expectation um, can widen or or change uh, pr asset prices. Um, so, so this idea that maybe just by threatening, let's say, to raise interest rates, you can, you can change investor behavior, and then, and then markets um, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy at, at, after that. So I'm, I'm curious because I got the sense that, that because people are pricing uncertainty, and to the extent that it, is, that it is much harder to price, then markets become more uncertain, that prices reflect that, and, um, and you know, and, and it, it, it's kind of a... It's no longer a reaction to, to information, and, and it's, it's more of an information-creating process. If that makes any sense. OK. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's been, uh, economics has been loaded with, you know, economics has been different to, from physics in building models because of forward-looking behavior. And that's been known for a long time. And, um, uh, and, 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 and our need to capture people's beliefs and expectations inside models, dynamic models, has also been kind of something that we've kind of been wrestling with for many decades. Um, the question is exactly how we do that and, and, and the consequences of doing it in different ways. So as, as I tried to say, one way to do it is to imagine invest, is investors have stuff figured out and, 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 uh, uh, and then they go with that model. Um, and for simple enough models, you know, one can imagine this Bernoulli approximation is a good one, and, 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 and that, that's a sensible thing to do. Here it's more about the fact that um, people, things are so com sufficiently complicated that people struggle in trying to figure things, you know, exactly things out. Um, and and there's this type of uncertainty that kind of never fully gets resolved. Um, <clears throat> now, you're right that part of what I want to get at is, is, is the fact that, that that wrestling with uncertainty itself can add volatility to, to a financial market. So that's part of the mechanism which I'm trying to sketch out here, and, and which I'm trying to add to this whole discussion. People's perspective on what is a good and a bad model can change depending upon where we sit in a business cycle. And that, that change in perspective can act as a force for um, moving around asset values in the, you know, without, just, with, without inventing a bunch of new shocks. So, the, so, so, so that's the type of mechanism I was, I was trying to illustrate. I don't know if that helps. When we, I feel like when we see some of the uh, models, charts, equations that we have in economics, sometimes we go back and, and, you know, the initial reaction is, oh, that's so amazing and impressive, and I just learned a lot of new things. Yeah. And then a second reaction later may be, wait a minute, that was sort of something I may have known about myself mm -hmm. before, that we don't know how many red and blue balls are in the urn, right. and that they could change over time. Mm -hmm. and that the entire model could be wrong. Yeah. Um, so when we kind of go back and try to 
create these models for human behavior that we all recognize yeah. goes on. What's the goal of that? Is it to get yeah. some kind of a consistent, you know, mm -hmm. uh, predictable something that yeah. you can then make policy with? Yeah. Do you think that we can ever get there if we're, yeah. if the entire thing we're dealing with itself is the fact that everything is uncertain and we just can't know? Right. So one possibility is to just say uncertainty is so complex to punt and give up. And, uh, um, that, and, and, and I guess I'm trying to take a different approach. I'm trying to build in uncertainty in somewhat richer terms, but, but still be in a position where we can use quantitative models to make predictions. Um, so predictions for different policy changes, uh, for changes in the environment and the like. And so I'm trying to uh, you know, <coughs> uh, maintain the value of uh, us building these quantitative models so that not only you know, just, not just useful for straight prediction, but, are, but are, I'm more interested in how they make us think about alternative economic policies. And, 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 um, and so how can we enrich the models to cope with uncertainty and still have them be valuable in terms of quantitative predictions about how people, for, for alternative policy responses. So that's the basic aim here. Um, you're right that it's an interesting challenge and a hard challenge, but in some sense that's what quantitative uh, economics is all about, trying to, trying to make Try to build models that are useful to, to uh, provide some form of policy guidance, but but you're absolutely right. You know, part of what I'm trying to capture here is things that you that, that hopefully you just find, get, that find somewhat intuitive. Um, and, and, and my challenge is to take those type of intuitive ideas and turn them into a formal model you know, framework and kind of put them to work in very interesting and useful ways. Does this work have any implications for the equity premium, like potentially explaining it or saying something else right. about it? Yeah. So so that's kind of the original. One of the original motivations for it, and I guess I should have talked about this a little bit more. That I think this goes beyond the equity premium, more generally to return heterogeneity. And and, and there's uh, the kind of reigning empirical evidence that is coming out of finance is that the compensations are bigger in bad macroeconomic times than good macroeconomic uh, times, and trying to understand better why that might be the case. And so this was uh, meant to be a little bit different, uh, among other things, give us a little bit different interpretation of what was on there. Um, now in <coughs> Uh, so kind of remembering good economic times here, uh, um, you're, you're thinking about less persistence. And so what that means is that you escape good economic times much, you know, much, much faster. So, uh, I, or at least you fear the escape will occur much, much, much faster. And whereas in bad times, you're, you're, you're there and you're afraid, you're afraid you might be stuck in a rut. And that type of mechanism can lead to bigger compensations in bad macro bad macroeconomic times and good, good economic times. Not coming through some made up shock, but coming through this uh, wrestling with what is a good and a bad model. So yes, it's meant to get at more generally why compensations might be, these, these market compensations might be bigger in, in, in bad macroeconomic times than good macroeconomic times. So the, the original equity premium puzzle, which I was uh, uh, um, uh, involved in the early part of my career, was all about things on average. But the more recent evidence was all about, well, the compensations are, are, not, are not big all the time. They're just big sometimes. And the sometimes tend to be in, in bad, ma bad macroeconomic times. So yes, that's certainly part of the motivation of this research. Thinking of the uh, Hayek quote that you provided, um, as we go on in our careers, we'll be exposed to reports from uh, researchers, uh, analysts, and uh, forecasts. Um, is there anything in your opinion that the consensus is something we can and do forecast accurately, but in your opinion, is something that we just don't understand? You mean the consensus? Um, so. what, what I'm getting at, uh, are there any key variables, key issues that, uh, in your opinion, are not properly understood, but maybe the media tends to tell us that uh, they are, and we'll be exposed to those forecasts? Uh, yeah, so certainly I think there's things that aren't properly understood. It's, there's been a lot of interest recently in trying to figure out how to you know, instead of doing what I described here, how to just use direct expectations data and build that into the analysis. And, you know, you know with, with one example, you know, using median forecasts and the like. And that, that comes up short for a couple of reasons. One is it's not quite enough information for us to, because, because, because there's too many type of forecasts which, which the models would require to solve. But also to really understand that, once I have these people themselves com coping with uncertainty, it's not, it's not entirely clear how you answer those survey questions and what the incentives are to, to, um, uh, to, uh, to give the answer uh, uh, to, uh, to 
um, to actually provide the answers. So if you're really uncertain as to what is the correct way to, what the correct forecast is, uh, do report your best guess or do you report some shaded version which is more conservative? Or suppose you're uh, a forecaster trying to make a reputation. Maybe you're better off with an extreme forecast, hopeful that uh, if you're, uh, when you're off, people will forget about it, but, but when you happen to be right, you're, you, you, people will be very, you know, will kind of remember you. So there may be as, you know, asymmet asymmetries in the, uh, um, in, in the, in the rewards and the costs and benefits to being wrong on forecasts as well. So you have to really think through issues like that in terms of, uh, so I think it's very valuable to actually bring in different types of survey evidence, but, but you have to also have a model of how people answer those surveys and how it connects to what you've got uh, in, in the model you're building. Um, one, thing, one thing that, that I didn't mess in, men, mention here is um, People sometimes talk about models of confidence and overconfidence and the like. And, and the framework that, that I described here, one, one could imagine multiple types of investors. One just completely convinced the model's right, like that dot, and some other person who's not quite convinced, you know, is uncertain about the model, and kind of put them together and see what happens as they, inter uh, uh, as they play out in the marketplace. And that's a direction in which I like to see this stuff going as a, as a way to kind of capture investor heterogeneity and, and with different degrees of confidence in, 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 the, in the models. And, um, the person could be confident in a bad model, so 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 like overconfident. So I'm um, so extreme confidence would, would would be rewarded by the marketplace if we're correct, but it would be punished if we're uh, not potentially if um, if we're incorrect. So kind of building a richer model of kind of of uh, belief heterogeneity, I think, is is is, is also a valuable way to go. And and and, 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 and putting in this new uncertainty dimensions, I think, helps one think through productive ways to 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 take that. Are there any e easy questions? <laughs> no, go ahead. Yeah. Um, speak a little bit more about directions that you'd like to see this type of work going, whether just within the field of macroeconomics or interdisciplinarily. Yeah. So I, um, the interdisciplinary connections have been important to me because, as I said, we're, I'm drawing in insights from statistics, control theory, as well as economics, and, and uh, put, putting the things together is really critical. Um, where I would like to spend more time, and I've, I've spent a little bit of time thinking about this, is in the policy realm. You know, it's one thing for you know Hayek to, to give this Hayek quote. But, but like, what do we do about it? Um, so, so I have to think about the following example, and this is like climate change. Um, we, the, science, uh, the scientific research on uh, our models of climate change are flawed. They're wrong. Uh, there's systematic biases in them, and this is kind of known, and there's also uncertainties attached to them. Uh, the scientific community is afraid to acknowledge this too much because they're afraid the public will therefore just dismiss climate change and throw it out as, you know, as something that doesn't happen. But if you really think about sensible decision making under uncertainty, you don't need to be 100% confident there's going to be climate change in order to take actions today. You just need the possibility that there's a, 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 you know, big impacts down the road. And so it doesn't require great precision to say to, uh, to get you to act. So the fact there's uncertainty on the table doesn't mean you don't do stuff. It means that you maybe do more sensible things. And so that's, so that's the type of direction I would like to see this going. Um, there's another area. Um, at, at the financial crisis, there's this buzzword that came out called systemic risk. And that systematic risk is what's well known in, the, in, in asset pricing, but, but so-called systemic risk. And the term was barely used prior to the financial crisis. If you kind of Google it before the financial crisis, you'd see very li little. And then after the financial crisis, it became everyone's favorite buzzword. But here's this buzzword that's supposed to guide our, 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 um, how we do financial market oversight. It's based on a construct that's totally amorphous. Um, I sometimes like to think about it, yet, that there's this Justice uh, Powell who wrote on, the, uh, uh, on pornography, and he announced that pornography is something that he's not going to tell you what it is, but he knows it when he sees it. And there's a sense in which systemic risk had that flavor to it. And I think really kind of, uh, this, uh, this is another case. Um, if we're going to be in the business of bailing out big financial institutions, we have to have some form of financial market oversight. But, but, but we shouldn't invent a bunch of incredibly complicated regulations uh, um, uh, that, that themselves create more uncertainty uh, as a way to go. We need more sensible, I think, more streamlined approaches to financial regulation. And, and I think thinking through things using tools like this can lead naturally to, to, to more prudent discussions of those type of phenomenon. So uh, you mentioned this model is sort of a response to, I guess, the historical rational expectations model. Yeah. Is it gaining wide acceptance? Yeah. I guess, you know, maybe outside of academia, potentially, uh, you know, in monetary policy decisions, you know, various central banks, things of that nature, and how much better of a job does it do in terms of, I guess, like fitting the empirical data? Oh, so there's two things. One is, um, 
You mean, will this approach do better empirically than the uh, rational expectations approach? Yeah. So, uh, you know, this is, um, we're still in the process of working out all the various different quantitative aspects of this. And, and the model I showed you today is too, Ill, is too stripped down to actually confront systematic evidence across the board. This is a challenge because people building models in economics, even under rational expectations, are very good at sticking in a whole bunch of shocks in order, in order to explain time series. I think the, the latest so-called New Keynesian models of the macroeconomy must have like 15 different shocks. I can't, I can't even tell you which ones they are. And, so we're, and, and, and then we're also inventing stochastic volatility shocks. So, so, so we can always invent enough shocks in order to explain the data. Uh, the question is, my challenge is to try to get rid of some of those shocks and replace it by things which we can kind of, kind of sink our teeth into and give more uh, uh, interesting interpretations to them. Whether at the end of the day these will explore, so hopefully if we do look at deep, deeper notions of explanations, then this will, do, this will help and contribute. But um, I can't, you know, the work's still too early on for me to, t to just tell you this is going to replace all rational expectations models. I, I, in fact, I'm quite sure it won't. So thank you. Okay, we done? Well, thank you very much.